Hey everybody, I am here with the legend, the mustached one, Spencer Strider, aka Quadzilla. What is up, Spencer? Hey, Ninja, doing well? Uh, glad <laughs> I call to be you here. Zilla. Is that like okay? Or is it, Snell's kind of got that Zilla. Thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Zilla, <laughs> Zilla's fine. Yeah. How do you like that nickname? I mean, is that is that something that you aspire to? Like, do you aspire to having the best quads and in baseball or is that <laughs> sneak up uh, on? it's maybe, maybe not a not an outspoken goal of mine but um you know physical you know fitness is important but uh yeah i mean some of the guys have started calling me quadzilla in the clubhouse so it's it's definitely taken pretty well i love it so are you more proud of your mustache or your quads <laughs> <laughs> i would have to go with the quads i feel like they've taken you know the mustache would have developed on its own but the quads were more of a uh intentional growth yeah so what was the what was the main thing like did that happen like overnight how hard did you have to work to build up your lower half like you have um yeah i mean it's it's been a, a process since high school when uh i was introduced to weightlifting for the first time and um you know there's the concept of as you're getting older you want to get stronger you want to you know have that translate to your baseball ability and um you know i think even as some things and some conceptions of, of mechanics and baseball have, have faded on or, or come to be incorrect, you know, lower, strong, lower half has always been, um, you know, pretty important. And, uh, you know, that, that translated to when I went to Clemson, the strength coach at Clemson, Rick Francois was, um, huge on, you know, getting us to be strong and pitching specific movements and, and, uh, stances, you know, lunges and, and split squats, that kind of stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, um, at some point it, it doesn't benefit you to just, you know, see if you can squat six, 700 pounds. It's more like, can I hold 400 pounds for six seconds in a split squat stance and just train that pitching specific, uh, movement. And, and did you, you started doing it more heavily in, in high school? Was that like, did you, did you have your own thing? Like high school is tough because there aren't a lot of great strength coaches. Did you look stuff up on the internet on how to do it or what? A little bit, but we actually, I was actually a part of a really good high school program. Um, I went to Christian Academy in Knoxville and uh, the coach there, Tommy Farr, who's still there is uh, he's sort of a legend in East Tennessee. Um, and uh, he had, he was big on, on lifting and we had our own strength coach and, you know, he was, he was a, a track guy, but um, you know, loved baseball. And, and so um, just, just any exposure to, to that sort of stuff is, is big. And when you're, when you're in high school, you know, it's sort of, if you can do anything, it's better than nothing. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we did a ton of stuff. A lot of it was, 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 you know, lower half based and, um, you know, some of it was just testing your mental fitness. I mean, or your mental toughness too, you know, like we would crawl across the outfield, you know, on our hands and knees, that kind of stuff, you know, run, we call them death miles where we'd have to, you know, carry farmers, carry 50 pounds across campus and just, you know, whoever finished last kind of, kind of stunk. So, <laughs> Um, that was the beginning of it. And then it turned into, you know, seeing it lead to results on the field. How important, so you mentioned mental stuff, and I think that that's maybe a little overlooked when it comes to all the physical work. There is a mental toughness part of it too, knowing you can overcome everything, knowing how far you can push your body, both in games as well as in workouts. Have you, did you learn some of that by doing in the whole process of doing that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think like my freshman year in high school was where I, I realized like, man, working hard is like, is a lot of work, you know, pushing yourself. I mean, that's, that's strenuous stuff to come to the, the edge of what your mind wants to do and what your body feels is comfortable. Um, and how to, how to manage that, you know, you can't, there's no benefit in really just almost killing yourself every day. Um, but there is, there is, still still you know now for me 23 years old i mean there's still purpose in in taking yourself to that that edge um yeah and, and i think a lot of it translates off to the off the field as well just um hey you know people go through some stuff and you know i've experienced some physical pain like this this really isn't a big deal you know it helps you kind of brush some stuff off and um we did uh we did something called stonewall solutions which was we had navy seals come in and um sort of talk about, you know, it was like a two-part presentation where they talked about um, some of their experiences, which will really make you feel worthless and insignificant. And then uh, then we did a physical part where it was sort of a team building type thing with um, with some stuff that was was pretty stressful. And, and you realize there, it's like, hey, you know, 
just do things the right way, stay committed to what I'm doing, then I can, I can do quite a bit, but it, it's going to be, it's going to be not so fun sometimes. You know, I think that that's one of those hard things for especially younger players to understand. And this is why coaching and, and talks like this are important because I, these things add up over time. They don't happen overnight. And I think players, young players don't understand how much work it takes every day. And there's a process of getting better over time. And that's why not everybody can be great. I mean, I think they don't have a long-term view. They're not willing to sacrifice playing video games for a little bit to do a little extra work or something like that. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it's just not having a, a clear direction, not having a plan. That's one of the things I learned from TJ Rehab at Clemson is it's one thing to do your work every day and, and you know, work hard. That's one thing. That's step one. But then it's how do I focus that, and make it worth it? Um, you know, and, 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 you know, when I was, when I was rehabbing, I, I like pretty much made a template and an image of like what I wanted to become mechanically and like what I wanted my pitches to do. And that started from the very beginning when I was still in stitches, you know? And so that's the kind of thing that helped direct the work that I did every day. Help me understand that. So you, I know you reworked your mechanics. Was this a you thing? You said, this is what I want to do because this is my best chance of throwing hard and staying healthy um, by doing your own research. Did someone else come to you and say that? And what were the changes you made and how you went about doing it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I never thought I had bad mechanics. I didn't think I had um, any risk of injury. And then, um, you know, I was a big long toss guy. I, you know, I was in good shape. I worked out, I took care of myself and then had good routines and then uh, warming up for a game like a week before the season in, in 2019 at college just blew out, knew exactly what it was and came right off the field and said, I just tore my UCL. And so, you know, from right then it was like, all right, this is, this is it. So um, yeah, the, the first part of it was just, man, why did this happen? You know, I really wanted to understand why do people get hurt? Why did I get hurt? How did I get hurt when right before I felt perfectly fine. And then all of a sudden now I've got an injury doing something I've done every day for my whole life. Um, and so that led me to understand that there were a few mechanical issues with the way I was throwing. I, I was, my timing was bad. My right arm landed really late or when my foot landed, my right arm was behind, you know, that kind of stuff, the inverted W, the, you know, elbow drag, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so I figured I needed to figure I needed to rework some of my timing, change my, my hip direction, um, change my arm path. And uh, yeah, so I, I started looking at guys that, that were similar to me that didn't get hurt. Trevor Bauer, um, you know, uh, Garrett Cole, um, you know, Shane Bieber. There were a few that were guys that had four seam fastballs that um, more compact deliveries. Um, and yeah, it's just tried to try to emulate some of the movements they did and found what was specific to each of them and or what was specific to those guys. Did you do that without weighted balls or without like there are a bunch of things that help help you figure out how to, how to make your mechanics more efficient. One of the things is weighted balls because you have to be efficient or else the ball, you know, it kind of janks with your arm. Um, the other thing, things right. like co the core velocity belt or something like that, which helps your lower half be uh, efficient. Is there anything, any cues or you just were watching these guys and said, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to emulate that. A lot of it was just, just pure self-organization, just, just cr like familiarizing myself with the, the movement I wanted taking a lot of video. I mean, I would video even, even days where my throwing was 60 feet and it was the lowest intensity possible. I had a camera out there, um, you know, frontal view from third base, just viewing my throwing because I needed to know, okay, what positions is, is my body getting into despite whatever I'm feeling they're, they're doing, you know? So, um, and then comparing that to, to what I wanted it to look like. And um, yeah, eventually when you add intensity, after training your body at those lower intensities to get into those positions, it starts to pick up and it starts to learn that that's what you want it to do. And so there are some days where it, it takes a back, you know, it backs up and it feels frustrating and other days where it's like, man, I'm really getting this, you know? So I think it's just, that's part of having that plan and having an idea of where you want it to end up is when things start to, to veer away, you know how to get them back because there is a goal. There is a, there is an image that you're shooting for. Are you this detail oriented with everything in this goal oriented? Because you do seem very uh, organized, have a good 
idea of who you want to be. Not a lot of young pitchers do that. Um, they maybe have a coach that, that has them do it, but it sounds like you own it. And uh, I'm just wondering if you're in that intentional with everything else. Yeah, I think, I think I, it's probably been a, a trait of mine, but when I, I mean, I, I, I attribute a lot to my TJ rehab and, and the uh, mental performance coach at Clemson, Corey Schaefer, who sort of took me when I had TJ and, you know, flicked me in the head and said, all right, here, let's, let's change the way you think because some of the stuff you're doing is a little counterproductive. And, um, and it was great for me and it, it got me into journaling. It got me to uh, sort of reevaluate how I evaluate my, my performances and, and um, just the concept of, of process and plan and purpose to, to everything that I did. And um, that sort of helped me become a little bit more self-aware of the things I was doing and um, how they were connecting to the field, you know, in, in a more healthy way than just, did I strike everybody out or did I, did I, you know, throw really hard today, that kind of stuff, you know? So um, it's sort of like, I, I like to call it like matching subjective and objective thoughts. Got gotcha. What type of things do you journal? You know, like, is it, this is, you know, I had a good outing. This is what went right this is something I need to remember because I'm a big fan of it too. When I coach folks, yeah, I, I want them to know when things go wrong, how they fixed it. Um, what went right in certain outings, what went wrong in certain outings so that they can go back. Cause it's really tough to remember that stuff if you don't write it down. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got my journal right here. I won't read you some things in it because those probably would not uh, go over well on the internet, but um, <laughs> a lot of it's just scheduling, you know, like it, it, but that's one of the things I learned last year is um, in the minors is when, when I, when I started to get into these inning levels that I'd never been to, you know, my body's breaking down. I'm feeling fatigued for the first time. I'm trying to replicate everything every week, but now I don't feel great because I'm on a five day routine instead of seven day routine. And so how do I condense my warm up, maintain my stuff, maintain uh, performance and everything. And then, you know, it, it's one thing to do that. Uh, but then you need to know how it's, how it's affecting you. And, and sometimes that's, that's where I talk about like matching subjective and objective thoughts. Like it's easy to walk away from an outing where everything went well for you. The results were good. You threw six scoreless, but you know, break it down. I mean, did, did it really work? Did you feel good? Were things on time? Did you execute pitches? You know, that kind of stuff. What was your energy level like? Because those are the things that, you know, cause long-term trends. Uh, and that's what we're shooting for here is consistency and, and longevity. Interesting, because I when I talked to Corbin Burns, what he said is he doesn't even look, he doesn't care about the results of his start. He cares more about what percentage of pitches did he execute. The, you know, he goes back, looks at them, grades himself, um, which keeps you away from. I think it's really easy, as you were saying, getting caught up in the results. You had a great result, but is that achievable all the time, or should I shoot for something? Take care of the process itself and then hope the results take care or the results will take care of themselves. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's awesome when you, when you pitch well, I mean, that's the goal here at the end of the day is we're trying to win games and at this level, especially, I mean, we're, that's all we care about. It doesn't have to be pretty and it's not always going to be pretty. You know, you talk, they, a lot of people talk about like the 10, 10, 10, 80 rule or whatever it is, where 10 of your outings, you're going to feel like before you even step on the mound that you're going to throw a no hitter. And then 10 of the outings, you know, before you step on the mound, you're not going to get an out. And then it's the 80 in the middle that, could go either way and it's that's that's where this stuff really takes hold is is how do i turn those days where i'm going to be struggling for it i maybe don't have command I maybe don't have velocity maybe don't have a certain pitch the guys aren't missing a certain pitch you know the hitters are step are spitting on a certain pitch whatever it is how do i adjust and that's that's bringing everything that that makes you good all the all of your stuff with you and i think it's it's journal you know journaling for me has been important but um having a routine. I mean, all these things, whatever, different stuff for different people, but um, you know, what, what, what makes one of the things that I've really learned this year is what, what makes me good is usually there. You know, I got to trust, trust my stuff. And that was good. But I learned that out of the bullpen really, um, you know, not having a routine, having some adversity and, and, and some inconsistency. And when I was pitching and you know, how long I was warming up and stuff, I couldn't worry about a lot of things that normally I can control. And so my sphere of control got a lot smaller and it was just, it was just here and I still saw results be there. And so that was good for me to just to see like, Hey, you know, what makes me good is, is, is here. And so let me, let me not worry too much about some of the stuff I can't control. Maybe some of the stuff that 
I can, but isn't essential. So it's interesting. So one of the things, you know, mental game wise, I think mental game is obviously really important and, and being thrown into the fire in the bullpen is something that you can take other things from. Are you more of a, like, I'm going to stay mentally calm type of guy? Or are you more of a, like, I'm going to get charged up and I'm going at you. Um, it's me versus you. And we're, we're, we're at war right here. It, it, I think it varies. You know, there, there are moments where you need to let the game speed up your adrenaline. But, um, you know, from the very beginning, like first pitch of the game, I think you just, for me, I'm trying to establish, you know, like the very basics of what's going to take me into the deeper parts of the game. You know, like I, I don't think you can just ride the, I mean, there's some guys that can't like Max Scherzer seems like every pitch he throws is, is he's trying to kill somebody. And that's really all he cares about. Um, and that, that can be exhausting for some guys, for me, that's, that hasn't worked. Um, I think sometimes I tend to get too fast and that starts and that starts in your head, you know, that starts with trying to do too much. And then that leaks into your mechanics and that, that affects the game. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's part of just pitching and and learning like who you are, I think. And then there's certainly moments where if you feel good or, or you need, as you're fatiguing in a game, you need to rely on something like, you know, get fired up, get, get into it. And normally that, sort of shoots your your energy up do you have a pre-pitch routine you go through or is it just generally depends on the game um not particularly i mean i that's that's one of the things i i that was one of the things that Corey schaefer tried to to instill in us and um i found it to be a little too um ocd and so for me i just you don't normally like get back on the mound and and you know kick the dirt off the rubber clean it off and then take a breath when i get on um i preset my foot so most of my time is just like setting my foot and then that kind of is like my my i'm getting back into the into the swing of things here help me understand that because i have noticed you you presetting your feet um and it's pretty unique i think too so when did you realize that was something you needed to do? That's a mechanical thing, I assume, helps your lower half get engaged. Um, but help yeah. me help me understand it. Yeah. So one of the things I identified as something to fix mechanically when I was going through TJ rehab is when I would I used to start both feet facing home um, or pointed towards home, and then I would sort of you know drag my right foot along the rubber to get it in line. And some days or some some pitches it would be more open. Sometimes it would be more closed. And so now, you know, if I'm trying to have consistency, my foot being in a different angle is going to completely uproot that. So, um, I, you know, I, one of the guys, like I said, I, I sort of watched for mechanical, um, you know, movements was, was Trevor Bauer. And that's one of the things he did. And, uh, I found that it just let me have far more of an aggressive lift and load and everything and, and not throw me off direction or off course. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I like doing it. I don't, I don't think it's something I'll really ever stop doing. I know it looks, it can look a little strange, but, uh, it works for me. I thought it was just flexing your lower half just to make you look. (laughs) It presets the quads very well for camera. Awesome. I like that. Yeah. Um, so help me through your, let's, let's just go through your mechanics. What are your checkpoints when you're, when you're throwing, like we started with the feet. Um, Mm -hmm. what other things do you look for, whether, when you're throwing good? Big one for me um, is just my lift at the top of my lift, not letting my leg swing get too out of whack just because I can be so aggressive since my foot is already preset there. I can get a lot of momentum swinging my leg back towards second base. And I did use uh, a cue from Walker Bueller. You know, he sort of kicks his left foot past his right leg when he lifts. And one of the things I was struggling with when I was rehabbing was uh, opening up too early and not getting as much out of my back leg uh, sit as I could have. And so I would shoot momentum towards second base with my front leg so that I couldn't open up before I was able to sit in my right leg, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, and so sort of the uh, residual effects of that is now that I'm really good with that, that movement, sometimes I'll um, sort of over-rotate as a result of swinging my leg. And so uh, one of the drills I do when I first start throwing for a day and then when I finish playing catch and, and I, I'm a game day and then I get into the bullpen to start warming up is I'll go all the way back up the mound 
by going over my head and then pausing right here. And I, I rest my hand and my glove on my front knee and I stop there, pick up the catcher and then I go. And so that step spot right there is a big cue for me. Um, just cause that's, that's really when everything starts to matter, um, in terms of being on time and, and on point when you're, when you're going towards the plate. When you, so when you were a kid, when you were younger, was this something you did to um, look at a lot of pictures, break it down? Like the, are videos helpful to you um, in your development? Yeah. I mean, I don't know where I'd be without YouTube. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of skills I have that are solely because of YouTube. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I just, I loved watching baseball. I mean, I was a, I was a big Cleveland fan growing up. So I, I watched a lot of Cleveland players, you know, um, Corey Kluber was, was kind of my guy when I was younger. Um, and, you know, there was a time where I tried to, tried to copy him. I had, I created a pretty bad hitch because I lifted my elbow way too high above my right. head, you know, trying to be Corey Kluber. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always loved watching um, like warm up videos too. Like there's, there's a gr- bunch of great ones of Kershaw because he does here are used to at least do a lot of his routine in the outfield pregame. And so everybody could see it. And so uh, I would, I mean, I would just crush those videos and just try and just like, what are these guys doing to prepare themselves? Like, I think from a very early age, I understood that whatever, and that's something that my coach in high school, coach Barr would, would tell us is, you know, these guys at the, at the highest level are good for a reason, you know, do what they do, you know, surround yourself with people you want to be like, and I couldn't be around big leaguers, but I could watch them because of YouTube. So that's what I would, would do most of the time. Do you pick up stuff from current guys? Like, I mean, you know, you're, you're surrounded by pretty good pitchers on the Braves as well. Um, and I think it, Charlie Morton seems like one of those guys who loves to teach or loves to point, give, give little pointers. But you have a bunch of good folks around you. And I'm just wondering if you pick up stuff still from, from other folks. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, just the stuff I've learned this year has, has been incredible. I think about, you know, where I was mentally and, and physically just from my very first outing this year to where I am now. I mean, it's just, it's crazy in that, that span of a, you know, that span of time, but um, Max Fried's been huge for me. I mean, he, he, uh, I think identified pretty quick that I was sort of kind of juggling a lot with being in the bullpen for the first time and also being a long, long man out of the bullpen and, um, still figuring out how my stuff played at this level. And, um, yeah, I mean, he, he said a lot of good stuff to me and we've, we've had a, bunch of great talks since then and, and, and the whole pitching stuff does I mean Charlie and and you know Kyle and Ian and I were talking yesterday about a bunch of stuff I mean there's there's always conversations going on and um you know I think the 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 dugout pitching staff is very tight-knit that way well you mentioned Navy SEAL stuff too um and I know Matt Sick, when I when I talked to him he mentioned how big that was and just even overcoming the, the yips like being in more of a, a fight or flight stage versus thinking too much. Um, so you can learn a lot from a little, like, I, I think we underestimate the importance of other things, even other than baseball and taking stuff from that as well, learning from players, but also learning from other walks of life too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that adversity is, is pretty important in anybody's development outside of baseball, inside of baseball. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think experience in anything is the best teacher. And that's that's what's tough about baseball is it's hard to let guys fail at the pro level because, you know, we're grading guys' ability to get outs and, you know, or to, to hit whatever it is. And so, um, but yeah, it's, it's I think what separates guys is just the ability to take those times where they do fail and learn from it. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's something you can get from on or off the field. It seems like Snit's really good at that. Like I've seen a few times where he'll walk out to the the, the mound. You think he's going to pull somebody. He doesn't because I think he just wants to see. He wants you to dig down deep and probably pull on those experiences later in the year to bring back. And like, hey, I trusted you. You can do this. Um, do you feel like that is, I mean, what what does he bring to, 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 to you as a, as a manager? Just confidence. I mean, it's, I mean, like the beginning of this year, we were sort of uh, still figuring things out. We had a couple injuries and, um, you know, things, things weren't exactly clicking and it didn't feel like anything was, was out of whack necessarily. It just, it just wasn't there yet. And there was no panic. There was no, no concern over it, you know? And then of course we just ran off 21 and 
and six in June. So, you know, it, it all works out eventually. And that's, I think that's just, that's just what we've been talking about, you know, trusting the process, trusting yourself, trusting your stuff. And this, you know, this team won the world series last year after an even worse start last year. So, um, yeah, I mean that, and that's something obviously that he's aware of and, and he, uh, he knows that. And, and there's no point did he, uh, instill any, any panic, like I said, and, um, you know, when, when you're able to just stay on course, when you know you have a good plan, it's, it's, it's all going to kick in eventually. And I think that's what you're seeing right now with us. You know, I find this, there's a little bit of uh, fans have a tough time with that. Fans are very, what did you do for me today? This guy sucks. This guy's, and I, I mean, this is one of the things that I try to preach on Twitter even is that have patience. There's a reason why when this guy got traded from your club, he suddenly got good. And it's because, yeah. you know, he was always that guy, but you didn't let him do that. Like you wanted to judge him right away. Um, and you didn't recognize these little things that, that were going to come out later on. So I think the long view is important. Absolutely. And, and I mean, in baseball, especially there's so many things that you can go off of to, to evaluate. I mean, there's, there's from a pitching perspective, there's your metrics, uh, the ball specific metrics, you know, I mean, just, just the line score, um, the composure, I mean, all these things go into the basket that makes you successful, but, um, you know, you can value one more than the other and certain organizations do and fans, the fans aren't aware of a lot of those things. They don't, they don't have the ability to be, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just part of the game too, I think. And that's part of anything is sometimes, so, you know, no, no experience is the same and no person is the same. And some guys can, can come in and, and, you know, really hit the ground running and other guys, it, it's just different. And um, that's also the part of baseball right now, that I think has been cool is with technology and with some of these new uh, methods for evaluation. And, um, you know, some guys are learning maybe later than they would have liked oh, this is what I need to be doing. This is what makes me good, that kind of stuff. And so that's, that's also something that um, can lead to some of these, like, why is this, why is this guy not performing? You know, that, well, that he probably doesn't know why he's good yet, you know, and that's just part of development. I think that, that, that seemed to me to happen with like Kyle Wright, for example. I think he had this stuff and I think it was a matter of getting confidence that he, you know, number one, simplifying it to go back to what he was good at but also the confidence of being in there, being successful. And then you can repeat that, but it's a long game. Like you can't, as a, as a, you know, a top draft pick, it doesn't mean you're going to get in the league and dominate right away. It means you have a lot of good stuff, but putting it together is sometimes an art. And you mentioned the new school technology, which I think like I'm a big technology guy, obviously, but there's also an old school component to it too, which is figuring out who you are. There's a mental game aspect there's a competition, a com you, you, you have to compete with your stuff that day, as opposed to wondering what your metrics are. Um, and blending those two can be tough as either a manager or a player. Yeah. Yeah. Kyle and I have talked about this all year, specifically just the two of us. And, and, you know, we, we, this conversation sort of stems off of, you know, we know we're going to have really bad outings throughout the course of the year. It, it has to happen. It's inevitable. But the realization and admitting that that's the case seems a little bit surrendering in a way. You know, it almost seems like I'm giving in to the to failure. Yeah. You know, like this, but, this but, is going to suck. Yeah, I get it. Yep. That's cool. Yeah. You know, and so it's, it's a it's about and that's that's part of the that's such a big part of the mental game. It's just the balance of accepting failure as inevitable. You know, my mindset when I was younger was success is striking out every batter on three pitches and throwing an 81 pitch perfect game of 27 strikeouts. That's success. It's possible. I can do that theoretically. If I ever do, man, you're never going to hear the end of me. But, um, you know, you, you can't you can't use that as your your base. And it it sounds like it feels so for people who are very competitive. And let me tell you, Kyle Wright is one of the most competitive people I've ever met. It's very difficult for competitive people to accept the inevitability of failure, but it is essential. It's actually, you have to, the most competitive people can do that because it will make them that much better. Cause it's, especially in this game, it's going to happen. You're going to lay an egg some days. It's just, you can't avoid it, but if you can accept it, it will make your, your successful starts and the, the, those 80% that could go either way, even better. Yeah. And, and just relishing, and we mentioned Scherzer earlier. 
Scherzer is one of those guys who loves the competition. He wants to go up against the best every time because it shows how good he can be. Like he wants to dig deep and realize how good he can be. Some people either get frustrated when they don't, you know, they fail in that situation, but it's, you're right. It's inevitable. Others run from it and they never do figure out how good they are. They're like, they want to compete against teams. They can dominate so that they can have a good record or they're not, they're going to feel good about themselves by caring a lot of, a, a lot of folks. Um, but I think the more successful folks seem to be the ones that love the competition of the sport. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, Casey Weathers and you know I think he's yeah he's with he was with driveline at one point yep um I've never worked with driveline but you know this isn't a driveline you know pump up or whatever but there's a video that he did um a couple of years ago that talked about sort of his journey and and it was a shorter video but one of the things he said is you know some people will never commit to working hard they will never lay it all on the line because if they do and then they fail then they have to face the fact that they simply weren't good enough. And so a lot of people will hold back. They will create excuses and it may not be malicious, but you know, they will, they will do things to protect themselves internally so that they never know if they were, they were good enough or not. They can rest their head on, Oh, it was this person. It was this, you know, something else kept me from succeeding when in fact it was really you. And that, that always hit me. And uh, that's kind of how I think the most successful people think is I want to know how good am I? And um, to do that, you have to be completely honest with yourself and you can't make excuses. You can't hold back. You have to be vulnerable. And part of that vulnerability is admitting, you know, as a pitcher, inevitability of failure, which is something that's very tough to do. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's, I'm sure Scherzer, he's not holding anything back. Like that guy wants to know how good he is. And he's pretty good. So, <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good. Um, and then the key is like, there's also a difference between making excuses and understanding why something went wrong. Like you can say, yeah, I did this or I wasn't at my best. I'm going to figure out how to be at my best next time um, versus saying I wasn't at my best. So throw out that game it's, and you never learn anything from it. So right. there, it's a bi there's just two different ways you can go with it. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of look at it like umpires, you know, blaming umpires. It's so easy when, and it always seems to be the case that when the game isn't going perfectly, the umpire is somehow a part of the, the reason. Um, even though he's always there, that's the thing about the umpire. There's always an umpire. He can make a bad call, no matter how good you're doing or how, you know, how it doesn't matter. Um, and so you, you have to make the active decision not to let that be a part of your self-evaluation because it's something you cannot control. You have no influence over the umpire and their ability to make a good or a bad call is there every pitch, no matter how big or small it may seem. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's just part of understanding what you can control and then basing your evaluation off those things. It's funny. I was talking to uh, Alec Manoa about that, about just bad calls or whatever. And he views it like the umpire's just testing me. Like this is just a hurdle that I've got to go through. And if I'm that weak that I can't overcome this bad call, then that's on me. That's not on him. Yeah. I think it, it's taken, it takes experience to, to gain that perspective though, for sure. I mean, that's something that I've learned too, is, um, you know, I have the ball in my hand. I, I can get out of anything with one pitch. It's just a matter of not getting in my own way, letting that happen. And, and you have to, you have to do it. You have to be in those positions to, uh, to find that trust in yourself, to have like two guys on and less than one out and, or less than two outs. And like, Hey, I can't strike everybody out. I can't like just back off here. Let me just trust that I can get a fly ball and throw a fastball up. And sure enough, they pop it up most of the time, you know? And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, but it, but it just takes experience. And that's something that it's easy to say that to a younger player, especially even if you've been through it, but they, they just can't grab like my experience. I could not grasp those things until I experienced it myself. I heard it constantly, but I could not, you know, just hold on to it until I, it happened to me. Oh, it's really hard. Like, and that's one of those things fans don't ever let it go. It's always, you know, basketball, every sport, it's the refs, the refs, you know, the refs, if it wasn't for that, those terrible yeah. calls, they always hate whatever team you're rooting for. That's just the way it is. And they really don't, they make mistakes like everybody else. Yeah. They're indiscriminate. They just, you know, they, they can't help it. I mean, there, there's some umpires that are terrific and they, you know, they should be rewarded for being terrific. And then there are others that, you know, they, they have bad games just like anybody else. So um, 
yeah, you know, but that's part of, that's part of what makes baseball awesome in my opinion. And that's why, you know, I'll go ahead and state my, my campaign against robo umps right now. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just part there's, I mean, like that, that inherent adversity of the game and, and the, like there's three parties involved, the batter, the hitter or the batter, the pitcher and the umpire. Like, it's just, it's unlike any other sport. And uh, yeah, I mean that, I think it's just, it's just something that's specific to baseball. That's, that's kind of cool, but it can be very frustrating. Yeah. Now, have you ever been, you haven't had robo umps at any level, have you? I have not. I've missed them, fortunately. Yeah, I'm just curious to how that would how that would play because it definitely changes the game. Um, there's some pitchers that would love it and say, you know what, all I got to do is catch a piece of the zone and and you know this is going to be awesome. I'm going to throw the wickedest sliders possible and just nip the zone. Others are like they like you saying I I would hate it. I like the human element to the game. Obviously, we've taken some of it out the human element. Mm-hmm. Why, you know, we don't have phantom tags or, or and stuff like that anymore. We actually look to see if to get it right. Um, but it's kind of interesting to hear the, the different views on it. Yeah. I mean, I just, the art of catching to me would, would be kind of, this is something you know, everybody's talked about this at this yeah. point, but I, I, I just don't think you can, you can take that out of the game and the robo ump seem, seem to, you know, almost unavoidably take out the, the art of catching. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that that right now for the game, I don't, I don't know that, that robo umps really solve any problems. I mean, there's so many guys like myself, for instance. I'm not trying to get guys to chase out of the zone. I want to beat guys in the zone, and that's that's kind of how the Braves raised me. Is you have the ability to beat guys in zone. You know, the Tyler Glass now approach of let me throw all my stuff hard in the zone and tunnel in that window that I'm likely to get swings, which means I'm likely to get contact that's weak when I do and I'll get a lot of swings and misses and I'll throw a lot of strikes and that's that's that you don't need a robo for that you know so I get it for like the, the Greg Maddox's that could could you know hit the you know hair off of a tee but um yeah I, I don't know I just think I think it really messes the game up if you, you put robo in there who did you admire growing up like as a baseball fan what who did you want to be uh, Ricky Vaughn, wild thing. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I always wanted to throw hard. That was really my thing. I wasn't allowed to pitch when I was younger just cause one, I, I was terrible at it. I couldn't, I mean, you know, mo- most kids aren't very good at pitching, um, which that's a whole other conversation when they're 12 years old. But, um, yeah. And just, you know, that, that was, that was the beginning of kids hurting their arms and everything. And so, uh, my parents were a little protective over me with, with pitching. And so I would just go out into the front yard and just, you know, pretend to be Rick Vaughn and game seven of the world series and just strike guys out on, on the bounce back net, just throw as hard as I could. Um, you know, so I, the, the harder throwers have always been fascinating to me. And um, like I said earlier, Corey Kluber was a big, was a big, uh, you know, I was one of his, his biggest fans and um and there's a lot like, I mean, just Garrett Cole is another one that I've, I've always liked. Um, I mean, there's, I'm, I'm fortunate now too. like some of the guys that I've, I've been big fans of like you Darvish, I I've pitched in a game that you Darvish pitched in. I mean, that's kind of crazy. That is, it, it, he's another guy that's just a complete artist on the mound. Like he is a total feel can develop a pitch instantly in a game just because he, need something that breaks a little less than this slider that broke. Like it's incredible. Yeah. An elite level of feel like Mac, Max Fried has that level of feel where he can, he can literally throw a sinker at 91 or he can throw a sinker at 99. And at any point in the game, first pitch, last pitch, he can throw a cutter. He can throw a slider. He can throw a slurve. He can throw a curve. He can throw it. You know I mean? It, he has so much like we, we joke on the bench all the time because he'll throw a pitch at 92 and then the next pitch will be 98. And we're like, what, how hard does he throw? I mean, what, like, what, what is his average fastball velocity? We don't know. He'll throw a slider at 81. He'll throw a slider at 92. I mean, it's just, there's no telling like what this guy can do. I mean, he's, he's it's an unbelievable master of the craft. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool to, to watch every, every five days. And he seems pretty like he's within himself. You watch his facial expressions and stuff. I know he's intense. Um, but like you have a different flair about yourself when you pitch, like, I don't met, you mentioned the Ricky Vaughn thing who had flair too. 
but it's the the k ruette thing that you do the just the overall mannerisms you're your own dude and i think that's why fans gravitate to you like the the mustache stuff that you'll see fans paint, you know painting on mustaches now you're an enjoyable dude to watch because you're like an open book for some really like i don't know if that's your personality generally but uh, you have this flair for pitching that makes peak, like you're, a whole generation of kids are going to want to imitate you now. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's, you know, it's flattering, but um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think um, I've always, I've never been afraid to be different. I think that's one of the things I learned early on is like, I'd rather be pursue the things I'm interested in and, and, you know, just be who I am than, than try and conform to anybody else's is desires. But um yeah i mean like the k ruette stuff like i don't do that intentionally that's sort of just a mechanical thing i can't that imagine that you do you could do it and like if you do it yeah. it'd be forced right you have to. right yeah that would be an injury risk i think <laughs> if i was trying to do that but um yeah i mean that i think that some of that stuff just comes from like there's been so much trial and error in my like the last four years mechanically for me and just just in baseball in general like trying to get better and trying to find new things to make me better and um that's that's taking from all different people on and you know all different ideas and perspectives and all of that sort of meshes together into whatever i am now you know and um like when i watch my my self pitch like i see i see the parts of walker bueller i tried to copy i see the parts of mike clevenger that i tried to copy i see the garrett cole the jacob de Grom, like all these these guys and I can remember like back to when I like literally where I was and when I was doing it that I tried to emulate these guys and um and I think that's important when you're a kid you know it's just like trying to get better try to be somebody that's better than you but also do some somebody that's attainable you know like when I was first rehabbing I didn't try to be Jacob deGrom just because I mean, that was a whole different thing and I still can't be Jacob deGrom he's Jacob deGrom I'm just the 5'11 dude who has a mustache but um <laughs> You know, I mean, there's there's something to learn from everybody, and that's not not trying to be yourself. That's that's figuring out who you are at its core. I think is is trying to grow, and you have to you have to learn from other people to do that. What do you think your next level is? Like, the, I, I watch you pitch, and I'm just like, you're almost a force of nature out there, which I enjoy. Like, you're one of the the more fun dudes to watch pitch. Again, because I can figure out a lot of your personality. It's evident when you watch you when when you see you throw. I like dudes who compete, who go at the hitter fast. But you know, I'm going at you with my my fastest stuff, and I'm gonna you know I'll I'll just be unique. Like you're a very unique unique style. Um. So, like, what do you think your next level could be? Is it? sharpening your pitches i mean you're already you pound the zone really well which i which i enjoy like you're not you're not just trying to you know you're going at hitters trying to trying to beat them so uh you know where, where do you see yourself going yeah i mean so we, we talk a lot about just like lanes and pitching lanes and um you know sequencing and i think that that's something that i've never really had to or never, just never really been exposed to, you know, in the, in the minor leagues, it was more of just hey, fastball up, slider down, change up down, fastball up, slider down, change up down. And just mastering those ideas of, of this is where that pitch goes. This is where this pitch goes. And this is where that pitch goes. And um, that isn't, you're not forced to learn a lot of like, Hey, I've got a guy on second base with one out. This guy's faced me twice. He swung at this pitch and he took this pitch earlier. What can I throw here to get a ground ball on the left side? Like that kind of stuff. Um, and how to do that with my arsenal. I don't have a sinker. I'll probably never be able to throw a sinker just the way my, my release is and how I am mechanically. So I'll never have a ground ball pitch per se, but I can create a ground ball just like I can create a pop-up. I've already learned how to do that. I feel like, um, so just, just, and that, that just comes from experience is just learning how my stuff plays. And as I get more comfortable with it, as I, as I get more into with my delivery, how do I, repeat pitches and hit spots so that I can have better sequences and, and learning what those are and seeing how hitters respond to me. Cause that's the other thing. A lot of these teams I'm facing, I haven't faced before. And so uh, I sort of have the advantage because these guys are having to figure it out on the fly. Um, but you know, once next year and the years after that, or second time, whatever, like I'll have to learn exactly what's going to get these guys out, what sequences are, are going to be best for certain teams and players. 
You mentioned facing you, Darvish, is kind of a cool thing. Like, this is what I like. Hey, I looked up to this guy. Now I'm facing him. What about at the plate? Is there anybody that 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 you faced and said, "Boy, I used to watch this dude, and now I am pitching against him. This is kind of sick." Yeah. Yeah. So when I debuted last year against the Mets, I got to pitch against Francisco Lindor. He's like the second or third batter I faced. That was pretty weird. I mean, I've got the guy's bobblehead in my room. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's pretty, pretty strange. Um, there's so many. I mean, that I'm I I'm so fortunate to have to be here when I am. And, and you know, I've always been such a, a huge baseball fan that I mean, I'm familiar with everybody. And so many of these guys that are still here, I mean, are, are playing or guys that I feel like I was a kid when I was rooting for him, even like two years ago, I was just, I was a fan and I still am. But so um, most of the guys I'm facing are guys like, Oh man, I've watched this guy play. I remember when he did this against this guy. It's like, it's just crazy. So um, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of cool ones for sure. I've been fortunate to face a couple of guys I know too. So um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's pretty neat. Speaking of guys, you, you may know, did, did, uh, did you and Keyshawn ask you over overlap mm-hmm. at all? Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah, I know Key for a long time. Um, so my son okay. played. I mentioned we were uh, he played for the Astros. They both played on the sixteen U Stros and uh, watched him develop. He was one of those guys that skinny kid. You always saw it in him that he would throw hard. And I think now he's kind of figuring out who he is. Um, as bulk yeah. up. Yeah, freak freak athlete too. I mean, he could he hit his head on the ceiling if he jumped in a room. So, um, yeah, I mean he. It's it's in there, and I think yeah, he's he's had, seems like he's having a pretty good uh, year so far with the Mets. Yeah, so he was one of those guys that you know you, you, you talk about early bloomers and late bloomers. Everybody, so you're 16 new Astros, big travel team. Everybody's getting offers, and he wasn't. I'm driving in between fields, he and my son, and he's like depressed that he's not, you know, that these folks aren't finding him, and it ends up he ends up being a complete stud because he was patient. He kept his athleticism and just, you know, that and, and and worked out. Like I, I think I even had a tweet early on that said, once this dude starts eating and lifting, he is going to be a menace. Um, but like for folks out there, it's not a linear path. Everybody, you know, just because you're struggling when you're younger doesn't mean you're not going to be the next stud. Yeah, that's it's one of the one of the bad things about social media and and perfect game and some of these other institutions that are recruiting institutions is it may, they, they project this idea that by the time you're 12 years old, you should be committed to an SEC school and throw in 95. That's completely not true. I, I wasn't, I didn't get big offers from schools until I was going into my senior year of high school. And in that span of like four months, I started to get pro attention and everything. I ended up getting drafted out of high school. I mean, it went from nothing to everything really fast. And, um, you know, and, and like I said earlier, I mean, a lot of the stuff I was doing back then to develop myself, I would think, I think now is pretty silly or, or the opposite of what I'm doing. And so even with, with bad knowledge and just good work ethic, you can be better when you're young, you are, you are just built to grow. That's literally what, what being young is you are growing. And so, um, any level of hard work and intent on throwing harder or going getting faster being stronger like it's going to show results you can absolutely refine it and focus it better but um yeah i mean the the patience is the hardest thing in in life i think and especially in baseball right now but uh you have to have sort of a patient ambition um and you know you want to get better but you know it can't happen overnight and that's that's tough but uh that's, that's what's going to show results for people is I think if they can just let it happen over time. Yeah. And I think, well, one of the big things to, for easier, how do you increase velo? Everybody wants that quick get, you know, the, it's like the get rich quick schemes. They want it to be like, Oh, if I just change my mechanics and do this, I'm going to throw gas. The, the best ways I've found, you know, gaining weight, good weight, um, weight room, long toss, being an athlete, you know, working on your athleticism, that has the biggest bang for its buck, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, intense, a big one for me, just trying to throw harder. And I, I don't think that that is understood as simple as it seems. Um, you know, and that, that, like for me, like long tossing was huge just because I would go out and, and understand my arm and, you know, feel it get loose. 
And then now I feel good. Well, let me try and throw really hard. And I don't have a gun on me every time, but um, you know, just the idea. It's amazing. Like what the idea of like, Hey, I, I threw hard today, like, what that does. And then you go play a game at perfect game. And all of a sudden you're throwing two miles an hour harder than you were the last time. And um, that stuff, that stuff's real when you're in high school. I, I firmly believe that where you can sort of trick yourself into thinking you're better. And then you are, um, but yeah, there's, there's so many different methods to, to develop right now. And, and I think all of them are valuable. I don't, I wouldn't put all my stock in any one thing. Um, there's so like, you know, weightlifting, conditioning, the mental game routines, you know, long toss, weighted balls, all of it, all of it has a benefit. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw all my eggs in any of those one baskets. I think you take parts from all of it. And that, that sort of inconsistency and, and, um, adaptation to each one of these methods gives you, you get something that you need from all of them. And those all collectively go to adding velocity. We keep talking, you, you mentioned uh, going through Tommy John a few times. Do you think that in retrospect, that was a blessing in disguise? And I think that this is an important thing because everybody is always like, woe is me. And there's a different attitude you can take to having an injury, which is I'm going to, you know, it's going it, to, it was for a reason. I'm going to use it for, for good versus licking your wounds and saying, you know, why me? It's like, you know, using it as a way to spur you on or to use it for growth or use it to enhance your mechanics, whatever it is. Was that, it was that a positive thing looking back at it? Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that, that's one of the things I was told early on is that because of this, good things are going to happen if you use it as an opportunity to get better. And, uh, I mean, I, that's just, I, I just didn't want, I think it was the first time in my life where it felt like, oh shoot, I could not be playing baseball in five years, you know, and that, that's, it's easy to trick yourself out of that reality when you're 15, 16, but when you're, you're, you know, 19 and you're in college and you've seen guys now for the first time, like retire from baseball and it, it's a real thing. And so that, that, I just did not want that to happen. I wasn't going to let that happen. And I felt like, okay, this is it. Like I'm going to start from the ground up and become somebody that can pitch in the big leagues. And it took several years. It wasn't just, you know, to the end of rehab and all of a sudden I was a big leaguer, but um, yeah, I mean that, that the ability to use those things to your advantage and, and to grow you is, is huge, whether it's baseball or anything else. What was it like hitting a hundred for the first time? It was pretty you know cool. that was a goal, um, right? That had to be a goal. Yeah. What stunk about it is it wasn't even a swing and miss. It was a foul ball. So yeah. it's like I get I throw all this, you know, velocity and I can't get, get guys to swing and miss. But um yeah, it was last year in low A. And uh it was like my second it was my second start. It was the third inning. And I mean, I clearly remember all of this. <laughs> and there was two strikes on a guy with two outs, nobody on. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna like throw this as hard as I possibly can. And it was a hundred. He fouled it off and um, didn't hit it again until I started pitching out of the bullpen at the end of the season last year. Um, and then sort of, it's just kind of kept doing this. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how you go from like, man, 92, I hit 92 today to man, I hit 95 today to then, you know, you sit 92 and you're like, ah, oh, this is so uninteresting. I don't care. And then you hit 98, like, oh my God, I hit 98. And then now it's like, if I throw a pitch under 99, I don't even, I don't even find it interesting. How important is velocity? Like, you know, you, you always get these arguments and I'm not saying you have to pick one or the other. Um, but how important do you think it is to, to the game? What has it meant to you? I mean, it, I think it's, it's so attached to efficient movement and command i think that it's hard to it's hard to downplay i, I don't i think by, by by valuing velocity you're also valuing some other things vicariously and um yeah i mean it's it's just i i like it's crazy how hard guys are throwing now and how many guys are throwing hard but it, it still doesn't change the fact that you have less time to react to the ball as a hitter and so if you can give them less time all of your pitches become better every single one of them and it's it's i wouldn't chase velocity at the expense of some other stuff especially health but um i don't, I don't think you necessarily have to anymore because we i think we know so much about developing velocity but 
yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't think you can ever downplay that. I mean, people try to make the argument that, you know, I'd rather have command over velocity. And I'm like, I don't think you would. I don't think you would. You know, I mean, command without stuff is just batting practice. So that's, that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's, it also opens up doors forever. Like if you're throwing 102, you're going to get more opportunities than a guy who's throwing 88 just in general. Like it's just what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's silly to expect a 17 year old who throws harder than everybody else to have the command of a major league baseball player who throws that hard as well. I mean, it's, and that's like, that's the expectation I had of myself when I started throwing hard as well. Why am I not throwing strikes? And I got to college and I was probably hurt, but I also had no command. And I just thought like, what, what is this? Why? And, and people coach you like you should be able to have command as a, as a 17, 18 year old. And most, most of them don't. It's like, like I said earlier, when I was 12 years old and I, I wasn't allowed to pitch. Well, one, it was cause I couldn't throw strikes. Well, how could I have thrown strikes? I was 12 years old. I could barely hold the ball, you know, like, it's it's just a game it's 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 those levels and then you know there comes a point where um and i feel like that's where i'm at now is i've learned enough about how i work and how my body works that i can understand what's going to lead to command without sacrificing any of my stuff but that journey is specific to everybody and and there's no there's no um you know whittling it down to a certain time frame like it, it can take some guys a long time to learn how to have command just like it can take some guys for a long time to throw harder I've, one thing I've noticed, and maybe I'm wrong, is you seem to use your platform for some for some social issues that are important to you. Um, do you feel like that's an obligation to you? Is that something you respect from other players that have done that? Is that just who you are again? Um, you know, what's what's the mindset on that? Yeah, I'm I'm not a super ostentatious person. Generally speaking, I'm not um, I'm not huge on social media. Like I don't I didn't. Like my fiance made me post on Instagram like a month ago for the first time in like three years or something. I mean, just, just to keep the account alive before they deactivated it. But um, yeah, I, th I think one of the things I learned as I got older and, and thinking, I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but in the sort of political climate is that the last thing that's going to help anybody is not talking about things. And um, diversity is, is relevant and it's here whether we want to acknowledge it or not and you know the people you work with the people you're friends with they all have different perspectives they all have different experiences they all have different points of view and um it's just silly if we don't engage in that conversation and we don't acknowledge those things because we can all be friends and we can all be um you know be around each other even if we disagree vehemently at times and so I do think there is some level of, of obligation to just put perspectives out there and just put points of view out there that somebody may not see. And I know there are people who follow me that feel completely opposite to things that I do and, and they will never see a certain point of view unless I retweet something or I post a tweet or something like that. And it, I don't, I don't plan to, or really love to engage in the whole Twitter thing, but um yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think there's that's the benefit of it is it forces people to see different perspectives and point of view. I don't know where we got that 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 wasn't OK to disagree to. Like, I'm OK disagreeing with folks. All, as a matter of fact, I get tired of people that always agree with me. I would rather deal with, mm -hmm. you know, talk to somebody who I'm poking at to find what they really believe and then have a real discussion about it versus I think social media sometimes leads to one side or the other and nobody ever meets in the middle. And they don't really listen. They just listen to themselves. Um, it's it's almost like their own echo chamber in their head. Um, so I appreciate, like, I I don't know. I've always been one of those guys who who can, you know, I, I, I have strong views on stuff, but I also like hearing other views. Like, I'm, I'm totally yeah. cool with somebody totally disagrees with me. It doesn't bother me. I think all, all I look for in people is just the ability to justify things. And, and, and my, you know, when we talk about stuff, we have this open dialogue, we realize, oh, shoot, this idea I've had for my entire life is completely wrong. What a great thing to realize that this thing I thought is not correct. Shouldn't we want that? Don't we want to, to think things of the world or think things of other people or institutions, whatever that, that are at least somewhat correct? And so you can't have that unless it, when we, we just shield ourselves um, 
we're, we get dumber. You know, I mean, the amount of things that I've learned are completely wrong that I was totally invested in in my life you know, in any topic is crazy. And that's made me a better person. And so, but you have, that, that goes back to something we were talking about earlier. It's just the level of vulnerability necessary to realize those things. And uh, there's a lot of things right now protecting those, protecting that from happening for people. And they put a lot of their faith in that. And um, yeah, so that's why I think it is, it is somewhat important that people with platforms you know, engage in that dialogue. I kind of, I, I agree with that too. I enjoy being proven wrong more than I like. I'll look for stuff to prove myself wrong just because I feel like I learned something versus always seeing the the same thing. But I don't, I think it's a lost art. I think coaches do that too with teaching. They don't want to learn the, or old school players. Like I don't analytics, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, like, yeah, I could figure out if my curveball moved by just looking at it. Well, you could have figured out maybe quicker if you saw how you were releasing it on an edutronic camera. You saw the metrics on it. Maybe you can make it more repeatable quicker without the trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it's, it's kind of like we said, I mean, there's so many different methods for development. I don't know why you would ignore one over another. There's something to learn from every one. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to try and teach somebody something, you have to be constantly reevaluating what you understand and what you know. And, and um, you know, that's, that's sort of, I, I think about like my routine and, and some of my journaling from the scientific method, you know, you have a hypothesis, you test it, you reevaluate. I mean, that's, that's how you do things. You constantly reevaluate. And I learned that mistake when I was younger, a lot of the things I thought to be true weren't, weren't accurate. And maybe had I questioned that more rather than than comforting myself with consistency in that routine, I wouldn't have gotten hurt or I would have gotten better faster. And, uh, you know, that's, that's important is the reevaluation. Two things. And, and then I'll let you run. Um, one is, do you think I'd look better with just a mustache? Or you think the beard is, uh... <laughs> I mean, you know, this whole time I have been thinking you, you could have a really nice mustache. I did in college. I like, I was an OG, you know, mustache guy, like back in the day, I'll send you a pic later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, seriously. So like, how much time do you put in on that thing? Not a tremendous amount. I mean, I'll shave, like I shave today, I pitched tomorrow. So I shave today. Um, you know, I mean, a little, little trim here and there with the electric razor. That, that's, that's really all it is. That's, that's kind of what I like about the, the mustache over the beard is I feel like it's, when I let the beard go completely, then I get kind of fuzzy and weird. And so I got to shave it. And that seems to seems to be more work than just clean shaving my face. So, um, but, and I don't look 12 years old, which is the big goal here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my mind, I don't know. I, I, I think the more of my face I cover up, the better off I am. So I just try to like, <laughs> I want a Charlie Blackman thing going at some point. Uh, I think that'd be oh, awesome. Man. Now uh, I think you could pull the mustache off. Be great for the logo too. The pitching angel logo, yeah, ooh, put a mustache a on there. Good point. I like that because I think the beard might be might be much on that. Um, twos, let's go. I know you don't have a baseball. You did not understand the assignment today. Uh, uh, but, no, that's totally time. okay. If you have anything roundish or just want to do like we can go through grips or even what you think about on each pitch, you don't even need to describe it with words. You're good with words. Mm -hmm. Let's go through. Uh, let's 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 go through the pitches with words. <laughs> okay. So I mean, it, I'm pretty simple. Um, four seam fastball. I mean, just just you know, on the horseshoe there, um, right across. And uh, I th I think splitting my, you can see my thumb right in between the fingers. That's how I think about. Um, so a little space between them. You're not you're not together. You're gonna a little space. Yeah, a little space, and then. Um, I don't want to cover, I don't want to get too wide because then these start to, you know, counteract each other. But if I get too small, then now I have my window to create pure backspin is much smaller because I'm only applying force in a small little spot. And so if something gets tilted a little bit, then it throws off the whole thing. So um, a little bit of space. And I just like on the other underside of the ball, I want to split my thumb in the middle like that in between the two fingers. And it's just, just flick and pure backspin. And then um, the slider, the slider is a little harder to explain without the ball. I'm really kicking myself for this. But um, so when I last year, when I learned a slider, I've never been able to spin the ball. I've always been so naturally behind the ball that supinating or pronating has, has been very difficult. And so um, the slider I, I, I got from Jacob deGrom when we 
sat down and we were like, okay, let's look at the metrics and the, the you know, on track. And then we saw the tunneling sheet between the fastball and the curveball I was throwing. And just, there was no, there was no tunneling going on whatsoever. The curveball was a good pitch metrically, but it did not pair with my fastball. And so we thought what's, you know, similar fastball, upper nineties, Jacob DeGrom, his slider stays with that, that fastball for so long. It's not the most it doesn't have the most depth of any slider for sure but it pairs perfectly with its fastball and so i thought well what are some checkpoints that i can hit here spin axis and velocity that's all i'm going to care about i'm not going to worry about the movement the depth the shape just spin axis and velocity if those things are right the pitch will be good it'll tunnel with my fastball so to supinate because i so naturally behind the ball i grabbed the ball like this and i thought i need to come through this way I don't, I throw it like this, but I needed to feel this supination where my fingers are at the front of the ball. And so I tucked my thumb under the ball, grabbed around the front part of the horseshoe where it comes around me you on know, the top. And I'm hooked on here with my two fingers. And I just think, you know, throw a karate chop. And um, that locked my wrist here. So rather than being here, which is how I thought about it, it's really here. And I'm able to be on the front of the ball and pull uh, the top of the seams there. And I get that, that gyro spin. And um, as I've gotten better with it, and if my, my arm has learned how to supinate more, now I'm getting, instead of like 10 o'clock spin, I'm getting um, eight o'clock spin. And I can, I start to get feel for like a seven o'clock spin where I can almost roll the curveball out sometimes and, and like sort of freeze a guy for, or steal a strike. Um, so yeah, that pitch has come a long way. And then uh, the changeup, which, which I will which throw you to the back. Whipped out, which was uh, it was nasty. Like I saw that, I was like, "Yeah, that's a that's a good pitch." <laughs> so I've I've, I mean, I've had a changeup. It's just been when do I use it and how do I? You know, how and I you may not have assistant. had to, right? Like early on, it was more out of the bullpen. You're just going at people. Yeah, well, and last year especially, the, the focus was just let's let's you know attack with fastball and perfect the slider, and then we'll add the changeup when we feel it's time. And um, so it's something that was a big focus for me in the off season and, uh, and taking from the slider and that development, uh, I learned, I can't supinate or pronate very well. So I'm going to be behind this pitch, however I throw it. And so then what, how, what am I going to do to shift the axis and get that tumbling changeup spin or kill spin? And I found out I couldn't really kill spin a ton. I, I'm not, I, I tried, you know, doing some, some Vulcan stuff or splitting a little bit. Um, and I just, I just didn't have a great time with that. So one of the, what I did do is I hold the ball with my index and pinky finger and I, all the pressure is right here on the ball on the sides. And these fingers are just hardly even touching the ball. And so when I throw it, I, come through here and I'm, I'm right behind the ball, just like a fastball, but these fingers are killing the spin of these fingers. And so I end up getting power from these fingers, but it comes in just a little bit later. I'm able to pronate just enough to shift the spin to two o'clock and get some, a lot of run. I get more run than I do um, vertical depth from the changeup, but that's really all I'm looking for because I get such good ride on my fastball. It's just some speed difference and some run so it stays on that that tunnel but uh is slower yeah that's kind of a unique look at a change up though did you come up with that yourself was that just total trial and error so the the pitching coach in double a last year dan meyer he he gave me that cue of try to put pressure on those fingers to kill spin and when i was working on it this off season and had an Edgertronic and had, you know, some more data, I was able to realize, okay, like I'm behind this thing. So I'm not going to kill spin necessarily. What I can do though, is lessen the influence of, of these fingers. Um, and that's sort of what happens is now I'm able to delay their impact on the ball until just in late enough that it shifts the axis, you know, so that I get some, some fade. And, and quickly, what is your, Lower half, obviously, we know the quadzilla stuff. What is your what does your workout consist of generally? Like, how do you how do you get the killer quads that you have? <laughs> um, a lot of lunging, a lot of split squatting, um, a lot of squatting, heavy, a lot of heavyweight. 
Yeah. Um, the, the heaviest thing that I'll do is a, in the off season is a, uh, hand supported reverse lunge. So that's, I hold on to the rack just, just so I don't fall over the weight doesn't fall off my, my shoulder and, um, step back one leg. It's a lot reverse lunge. Uh, and I'll get up to over 500 on that. And then, um, I'll deadlift, you know, and I, I just trap bar deadlift, not a, not a ton of weight on there. I, I still, I still struggle from the TJ and how much I can hold in my hands. Um, but then, uh, yeah, a lot of squatting, a lot of chain squats, um, speed squats, uh, just low, lower body variation and, um, you know, try and try and juice up the legs and then, uh, throw hard. Awesome. Well, I will let you run. This has been great and you're welcome back anytime maybe next time with a baseball who knows maybe next time i think i owe you a baseball interview yeah (laughs) well cool dude keep tearing it up and uh like i think everybody out there loves watching you throw so just know that you have even opposing teams rooting for you like you're everybody's favorite pitcher so (laughs) (laughs) well i don't know about that but that'd be awesome (laughs) cool man well take care thank you yep thank you